So in, in view of the time and in view of the fact that we have five speakers on this, uh, uh, on this, uh, on this panel, uh, I'm going to be relatively brief. Uh, what I want to do is to just make a couple of points to seed the discussion. Uh, and I want to talk about some global patterns of inequality. Um, we're often told that, that we're, in a, we're in an age of rising inequality. Uh, and indeed, uh, for those living in OECD countries, this, uh, this may indeed be right. Uh, and indeed, for those living in uh, Asian economies, this may be right. But of course, there's tremendous diversity. And that's my first point that I want to emphasize, which is that there's tremendous diversity in the patterns of inequality uh, in the world. Uh, as, we, uh, 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 as I said, for OECD countries, uh, there has been rising inequality as we conventionally measure it. And for the large Asian economies, there's been rising inequality as we conventionally measure it. But of course, we all know that for Latin America, there's been decreasing inequality in the last 15 to 20 years. And this particular pattern <coughs> has been much analyzed and much, uh, much talked about. So it's not just a story of rising inequality uh, globally. Uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, I gather there was a panel uh, yesterday on this. Uh, I think the data are all over the place. Uh, so for some countries, uh, inequality is rising. So for some countries, it's falling. Some countries, it's stable. So it's, it's not entirely clear what, it, whether there is a common pattern uh, or not. Uh, for MENA, uh, in, uh, Middle East and North Africa, it seems as though the pattern of inequality, again, as we conventionally measure it, is rel has been relatively stable. Uh, and that actually raises some interesting questions itself. And I'll come back to that. And finally, if we were to take a country like China and look deeply into China's uh, pattern of inequality, uh, trends of inequality over the last, <coughs> uh, uh, since, since the reform process, we have the first 10 years of falling inequality, the next 20 years or so of sharply rising inequality, and that's what we m most know about. But I think one would say that from, from about the mid-2000s, uh, there are indications of that increase in inequality plateauing, and on some indicators, probably even beginning to turn down. So, so actually, the global pattern is really quite uh, diverse. And I think as analysts, we should be perhaps more interested in that, in the diversity of those patterns, as well as whatever common trends there are, and why the common, common global forces of technology, et cetera, are, are manifesting themselves in such different ways in these different, in these different contexts. <clears throat> So let me take uh, uh, MENA as an example, uh, Middle East and North Africa. Uh, we're told, again, we're told in the popular press that it was, it was inequality that caused uh, the Arab Spring. But actually, inequality, as we, commonly, as we commonly measure it, as economists commonly measure it in terms of our genies, which come out of our household surveys, in, in for example, in Egypt and Tunisia, have been relatively stable. <laughs> in fact, in, many, in some cases, falling before the Arab Spring. And that actually raises some very interesting questions to my mind as to, uh, as to whether, in fact, we're measuring inequality right, uh, whether the way we measure inequality right has any connection at all to political uh, turmoil, or what? What's going on? What exactly explains, uh, in, terms of, in terms of our thinking about inequality, what, uh, what's the relationship of that to the political upheaval that we saw in these, uh, in, in these countries? So that's a point that I put to you, and a fair, some discussion is going on, some a a a analytical work is going on in this, in this area. Let me turn then secondly to China. <clears throat> uh, and I want to talk a little bit about what, might be, what we might be seeing now, which is a turning point in Chinese inequality. <laughs> that in fact, it could well be that from the mid-2000s, uh, uh, there's some stabilization and perhaps even a turn down of Chinese inequality. And we might ask ourselves, why? What might be the underlying forces uh, behind this thing? Still very high. Uh, of course, but uh, there's stabilization and perhaps turning down. So let's think in very simple analytical terms in terms of, just think of two sectors, rural and urban, and think of inequality as being a weighted sum of the two inequalities, uh, as well as, of course, the difference in the means between the two sectors and the population weights of the two sectors. So in a standard way, you'd think of uh, the overall tile, for example, as being a function of the, <clears throat> of the sectoral means, of the sectoral inequalities, and the population weights in the two, in the two sectors. <laughs> And in effect, I think what has been happening in the Chinese context uh, is that the, that the within sector uh, inequalities are being stabilized because of changes in policy, because of uh, social security provisions, and so on. The mean differences between the sectors are also beginning to stabilize. It's been argued by, for example, uh, Zhao Zhang and others that the lowest turning point may have been reached in the, in the Chinese context, where in fact, uh, because of the tightness of the labor market, rural wages are now started rising uh, as well. 
And a third factor, which I think is less appreciated by economists uh, uh, and analysts, is that the simple population weight of the two sectors also affects overall inequality. Holding the sectoral means constant and holding the sectoral inequalities constant, simply shifting population share from the low, from the low mean, low inequality sector to the high mean, high inequality sector, from rural to urban, has an effect, independent effect, on inequality. And that's the so-called Kuznets effect, the Kuznets process, and Kuznets emphasized this a lot. Uh, Zhu Zong Zhuang and I have done some analysis which shows that for several Asian uh, economies, so holding everything else constant, where do they lie in terms of this population shift part? And China, is, in, in, in terms of our analysis, is actually beyond the point of urbanization where inequality as a result of further urbanization is now beginning to have a negative effect on inequality. Okay. India, for example, is on, the, is on the other side of the Kuznets hump, so to speak, where urbanization in, a, in and of itself, pure, the pure effect of urbanization would be to increase inequality in, in the case of India, but China is over that Kuznets hump. So actually increased urbanization will further decrease inequality in the, in the, Chinese, in the Chinese case. So there's an example, I think, of, of the, the, the great Chinese turnaround in inequality. We may, we may be about to see it in the next uh, uh, seven to 10 years. So uh, uh, we, have, we have the MENA case, which has its own uh, diversity and particularities. We have the China case, which has its own particularities and diversities. Let me now turn to OECD countries. And this is the, this is the, uh, the column that Joe, that Joe and I did. And let me just talk a little bit about, about that. And of course, much of the discussion in the OECD context is, is of course, uh, framed by Piketty and the post-Piketty discourse. Uh, and we have really two uh, the, way, the way that uh, we can think of it is that if we go back 60 years, we have two great stylized facts that Caldor, Nicholas Caldor put forward in terms of, his, of the experience of the 50 previous years of advanced economy uh, uh, growth and development. The two, great style, two of the great stylized facts that Caldor put forward were constancy of factor shares, constancy of the capital output ratio, and constancy, uh, constancy of, the, of, uh, of the share of capital in total output, and constancy of the capital output ratio. Okay. And a generation of models, including the solo model and all its variants, devoted themselves to try to explain the constancy of these great, of these great numbers, of these numbers. Okay? Uh, and of course, no sooner had that, had, had that project been completed that the stylized facts began to change on us. Okay? And of course, the, the, the thing that uh, Thomas and others have emphasized is that the share of capital is rising and the capital output ratio has been rising in the last 20 to 30 years. And if that's the case, we find it's going to be very difficult to actually explain those in the, in the context of a standard solo f of k comma l model, unless the elasticity of substitution uh, has values which, which we don't see empirically. Okay? And that's, that's a conundrum that we face. How can we explain these new stylized facts with a class of models which are developed to explain the old stylized facts? And I think that's, that's a theoretical challenge that we face. In fact, it's very difficult to do it. it, it, it one can't do it if we strictly interpret the wealth, that the, we, the wealth data that we have that, that Piketty uses in his, in his, in, uh, in his uh, analysis as being the solo K, uh, it's, it would be very difficult for us to actually uh, make, that, make that whole thing consistent. So uh, Joe, has, Joe has argued in his, in his writings that really we need to think uh, much more in the context of rents to explain the increasing share of capital. Uh, we need, really need a theory of rents to different factors in order to explain the new stylized facts as they're developing. And he gives the following example, which I think is very, very interesting, and, and we refer to this also in our, in our, in our column. Suppose, for whatever political economy reason, <clears throat> uh, the government gives a guarantee to banks. Too big to fail, whatever, whatever it is, guarantee to banks. They will not be allowed to fail. Well, of course, this, is an, this, is a, this guarantee can be explicit or it can be implicit. Well, this, of course, increases the value of bank shares and pushes up the, that, that, particular, uh, uh, that particular component of the wealth distribution. So in fact, and of course, there's an, implicit, there's an implicit liability on everybody else in the economy as a result of this implicit guarantee. And what, we've had, what we see, therefore, is a, is a redistribution of national output. It's essentially the increase in the wealth leads to a, uh, is a, related to an increase in purchasing power of the people who control that wealth. Uh, it's a redistribution with actually no, no change in any output aspect of it at all. There's, there's been no change in output, nothing at all has changed. It's simply this guarantee which has led to a redistribution of wealth, which has led to this redistribution of purchasing power over the, over the economy. So in a sense, we need a theory of rents 
in order to, ex uh, and, and if we have a theory of rents, we can better explain, uh, according to this uh, column that Joe and I wrote, uh, the new stylized facts. And we certainly cannot explain these new stylized facts with the standard solo model with marginal productivity uh, theory of, dis of, uh, of distribution. So those are my, the, those are my observations. Uh, we have a very diverse pattern of distribution around the world. Uh, MENA, uh, the question is, how can our standard models, uh, how can our standard measures of inequality, standard measures of distribution uh, uh, derived from household surveys relate at all to the political process? They don't seem to in this, uh, in this case. For China, a highly differentiated pattern of inequality change over the last, uh, or since the reform process. And we may now be seeing, actually, a great turnaround in Chinese inequality and we need to understand why and how of that. And thirdly, in the case of OECD countries, we actually need new theories in order to understand these new stylized facts because the old theories cannot explain them. Thank you. Oh, you have uh, two to three more minutes to explain <laughs> how you define the diversity of uh, inequality uh, from the sectoral point of view, not uh, by country's point of view. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, could you pose the question again to me? Yeah, you can explain a, a little bit to, to us about uh, your observation on the uh, different aspect of uh, inequality, not only to income inequality, <coughs> okay. which are coming um, by sector by sector. Well, let me take up one issue, which uh, <clears throat> I was going to I was going to discuss in some detail if if we'd had the time, but. Uh, so one response to the Piketty type, uh, uh, to the Piketty type uh, uh, data and, uh, uh, and discourse is, you know, it's not really inequality of outcome that matters at all. Uh, inequality of outcome has obviously increased, and this we see that in the data. It's inequality of opportunity that's important. Uh, uh, and so long as inequality of opportunity is under control, uh, that's going down, it doesn't really matter whether inequality of outcome has increased or not. And this is, again, something that I've written about uh, uh, more recently. This is now inequality of what is the, is, the, uh, is the question. So perhaps I can say a few words here. I see my good friend Chico here, and he can, he can also uh, uh, join in, in this uh, thing. So from a normative point of view, uh, the, sort of the, the John Romer line of argument, what is that line of argument? It is that you can think of outcome, let's say it's income or education, whatever it is, is determined by two things, an individual circumstance, those things which are outside the control of an individual, and an individual's quote-unquote effort, those things which are in control, in the control of the individual. So if I can attribute that bit of inequality to circumstance and some bit of the inequality to effort, that bit which I can attribute to circumstance is truly illegitimate inequality, and that bit which I can attribute to the effort of the individual, the, the things that are under the control of the individual, the individual works hard and all this sort of stuff, then in some sense that is legitimate inequality. And underlying the notion that the rise in inequality that we observe is not, is not necessarily of too much concern is what if that rise in inequality is the, is the result of effort rather than circumstance, rather than uh, that in fact it, it's legitimate uh, rise in, uh, in inequality and, and from a normative point of view it should not be a concern at all. And I and, other, I and uh, uh, others have, have critiqued this position and said that really the, dis the distinction between inequality of outcome and inequality of opportunity is a very difficult one to make uh, uh, in practice, empirically, but it's also very difficult, in my view, to make conceptually, to separate out, even conceptually, those things which the individual controls and those things which the individual does not control uh, is, very, is very difficult. And the example that I give in my, in my writings is what happens when the effort of one individual becomes the circumstance of another individual? Okay? The effort doctrine, you can think of parents' effort becoming the, the circumstance of the children. Okay? Uh, the effort doctrine then says the outcome of that effort is perfectly legitimate and you should not therefore intervene. The circumstance doctrine says whatever is outside the control of this individual should not, should not be, uh, uh, should indeed, it is indeed legitimate to address that thing. So I give that to you as a conceptual issue, uh, which I think, is, which I think is, is, <clears throat> is a difficulty for this literature. But leaving that to one side, I think empirically it's difficult to separate these two out, and, and that's, that's been another uh, aspect of this literature that I've been, that I've been working on. 
Let me stop.